On the retro show today. Wow. It's a real mishmash. PCP way! You weren't there. You don't know. He's remade this using Unreal Engine. Lovely little homemade Mario thing there. That's very cute though. The audacity. <laughs> No, it's episode two, not number two. Oh, hi, Chip Dippers. Oh, yes. Hello, Chip Dippers. Welcome to Retro Recipes and welcome to The Retro Show. The Retro Show. Where we're going to be having fun with your homebrew games, nostalgic photos, retro memes, retro news, and a retro recipe quick bite where I tell the incredible story of trying to rescue 50 childhood discs that have been stored in my parents' attic for a quarter of a century. You're not going to want to miss that. Oh, and speaking of discs and homebrew games, this retro show is sponsored by Dragon City, the free-to-play game for Android, iOS, Windows, and even Amazon. Collect hundreds of dragons, breed dragons to get new ones, then feed and train your dragons and take them off to battle. Oh, poor things. There are different player versus player modes, and you can fight in real time against your friends. And with weekly events, you can discover and play new adventures. You can even find some of your favorite YouTubers in Dragon City. Wait, why aren't we in there? Puppy Fractic would make a great dragon. We'll click the link in the description and get a free reward of 15,000 food plus 30,000 gold plus the rare Fire Knight Dragon. Well, this message is really starting to drag on. <laughs> I hope you see what I mean. Okay, so we're going to look at some funny memes. Now, does this remind you of anything? Um, they look like rabbis. This is in Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, but a few people pointed out that it, this was a real-life version of uh, a certain game. Oh, Spy vs. Spy. Exactly. And actually, <laughs> right, right there, we have a copy over here. It's a good thing about having everything here in the studio. <laughs> spy vs. Spy. So um, there's those two, those two guys. That's really funny. And he's got, like, that could be hiding the briefcase with all the stuff in, and this guy's about to ambush him. Mm. So I thought that was funny. And you have a connection to Israel, don't you, Jerusalem? Yes, I speak Hebrew. I was raised by Israelis, as your parents often do raise you. Were you Israelis? I. Mm. <laughs> So yeah, Hebrew is my first language. Shalom. Shalom. Uh, shalom uh, And uh, yeah. So the, Who's Nikolam? Lekololam. What's Means like mean? hello to everyone. All, uh, all of the people, the world. Shalom lekololam. <laughs> is that good? Yeah, it's not too bad. Okay, let's see what we've got next. Oh, this is a lovely story. Um, would you like to read it? Age nine, always wanted a Nintendo console. However, it was just a distant dream. Using his creativity and with the help of his uncle, he made a cardboard Super Mario game, posted it on YouTube, and the video went viral. Thanks to the video, Nintendo CEO Doug Bowser personally traveled to give a cease and desist order and sue his family for $200 million. So, such a lovely, touching story, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that's his real name as well, Doug Bowser. Uh, Is that where the character comes from? I don't know if. No, I guess I couldn't be vice versa. I could if the, the guy was named after the character. No, they're cause... like, your name is exactly like one of our characters. Yeah. You're hired. Uh, very touching story. Um, for legal reasons, I should say that's not true. But a lovely little homemade Mario thing there. That's very cute, though. All right. It's just for you. <laughs> I know that you love that meme that's been circulating. I don't know what I love more, the song getting stuck in my head or Bernie's mittens. Like, in a world of fun and fantasy and ever-changing views. Boom! Um, so Tony Landy created this. He has a great channel, so go check that out. Mm. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, and he helped us out with the, what was it, the mini Commodore Pet video 3D printed. Are you still there? <laughs> yeah. Is that dog getting bigger? I think so. So Bernie is keeping up with the Commodore. <laughs> Now, here's a visual representation of how data oh, yeah. data sizes have changed. But also, I remember back in the day when I had my first um, ooh, tickly. Uh, I had Your my first tickly? <laughs> she was sniffing in my ear. And my first uh, digital camera is a 3.3 megapixel. And getting those SD cards 
I remember it was like 40 to $60 for like 128 megabytes. It was so expensive. And now you can get like a terabyte for like $50. And, and that's probably with inflation, the price of the Starbucks now. Yeah. $128. That's about right, yeah. <laughs> from 1991. Um, now, this is fun. So I'd like you to be the role of the lady. Okay. So you read this and I'm going <laughs> I'm going to be the other person. I wonder if people on the date in 1955 thought, OMG, this is the day Marty went back in time, too. Uh, no, no, they didn't. The movie didn't come out until 1989. I know that it came out in 1989, not 1955, not 2015. I'm not stupid. I'm just saying, I wonder if a lot of people were talking about it back in 1955 like we are today. <laughs> are you sure about that? I'm not stupid, but they couldn't have known about Back to the Future in 1955. You weren't there. You don't know. It didn't come out in 2015 and we're talking about it now. It's just like they were talking about it in 1955 too. Let's assume this is real. What was, what's this person thinking? Can you even get into the mindset? I mean, do I have to? Maybe she thinks that like, this actually happened in 1955. So when they see <laughs> Doc Brown and Marty, they were like, whoa, I, 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 I can't. Yes, it's Doc Brown, that's right. Yeah. She's a fan of Einstein. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, wherever she is, if that person is real, God bless her. It hurts my head thinking <laughs> about it. And now time to move on to old news. Old news. Yes, so this was awesome news. Um, David Crane, who, as you know, created Pitfall and Ghostbusters and many of our favorites, along with many other talented people, announced a new company called Audacity Games. The audacity. <laughs> the, literally, the audacity of that, because they're going to be making brand new games for the Atari 2600, which you can maybe see right behind us over there. Who would have thunk? Who would have thunk it? Who would, would you have thunk it? I don't think she's thunk anything. She thinks, she thinks a lot, according to those speech bubbles. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, she, she knew she could sneak in a kiss then. This is a, co a console that's 40 years old, and he's going to be making new cartridges and releasing them commercially. Isn't that incredible? I'm really excited for it. I can't wait to see what they come up with. Because obviously there have been homebrew games and people have released stuff on tape, but there's something... Uh, Sam's journey as well for the Commodore 64 was on cartridge, but there's something about old Atari cartridges, because that's... That was one of the first consoles. The other cool thing, he said here, that they're gonna be customized with a unique serial number and every game connects to the internet through your connected mobile device. for registering high scores. Uh, you can earn physical high score patches like those from the golden era cool. of 2600 games. So I guess there'll be like a QR code or something on screen that you scan with your cell phone and, or some kind of code that you can legitimately, you can't fake your high score with and that their system will know. Are, are you implying that people used to cheat? No, definitely not. No, nobody nobody with a yeah. long dark hair and a, and a beard as well has recently been. Well, that's a whole con another controversy, but we won't go into that. Moving on. So you know the old IMAX. Yeah. The In the colorful flavors they used to come in like- I um, didn't have one, but I always wanted one. Right like Blueberry and all of that. Mm. So this is a rumor from this channel, uh, FPT, and he's rumoring that the new IMAX are gonna be released in all of these beautiful pastel flavors and colors. Mm. So it's very I much, That's very much very Apple. cool. Yeah, going back to their roots with this kind of um, old school, colorful feel. So mm. look at that one. I love the blue one. Yeah. So these are obviously just mock-ups. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be due for an upgraded IMAX soon. <laughs> Which color would you get? I quite like that. That's, the blue one? Yeah. Um, or maybe if they came out with a retro one with maybe the old the old school logo. Ooh, the yeah. Colorful, you know, the colorful Apple logo. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea with that. So on the back of that, this is another, this is just a mock-up by um, a guy who's done 3D render. And I think it's available for 3D print download. You can put the modern Mac Mini inside this 3D printed case. I'm surprised you haven't thought of this yet. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the, the 1541 Mini, which you can see up there. Yeah. Um, kind of that idea. 
Uh, Maybe because you don't have a Mac Mini. I don't, yeah, it didn't occur to me. But I like that on the front, the USB slot um, lines up perfectly with where the floppy drive oh, would have been, kind of like on the Macintosh, the original Macintosh there. Very cool. So he's done a cool job and he's kind of visualized what the, the new Mac um, monitors might look like. As you do a very graceful reach out with your paw. Thank you, both of you. As you do it. If I did get one, I'd slap the old logo on the back. Why would you slap it? Okay, as gracefully as puppy practice does her paw. <laughs> Um, now, we should mention PCB Way! <laughs> PCB Way! Oh, thank you, Adriana. And thank you, PCB Way, for your great quality, great value PCBs. And from five bucks to this week's quick bites. Because as we all know, PCB stands for Precious Cardboard Boxes. Wait, you'll see. And in this quick bite of a retro recipe, we're traveling back to when my collection looked like this, three years before I even started this channel, for a reconstruction of an incredible story that I've always wanted to tell here. See, Lady Fractic and I took a trip back to visit my family in London, leaving Puppy Fractic the third to, oh wait, no, she, she wasn't even a twinkle in her Daddy Fractic's eye back then. But anyway, on the flight, I thought about how one of my biggest regrets was letting all of my original childhood computer stuff go. Anyway, back in London, my parents asked me to help them clear out the attic, and up there I found boxes containing my old Star Wars and Lego stuff, and I even found my old Nine Numb action figure still sitting in the Millennium Falcon cockpit, which was just incredible to me because not one month before I had just found the original Nine Numb voice actor, Kipsang Rotich, so we could record him for the Force Awakens movie release. The Force works in mysterious ways. But opening those boxes up, well, we all probably know that feeling. It's like discovering buried treasure. The sights, sounds, touch, even smell all hit you in one huge, wonderful, colorful flash of childhood nostalgia. But there, off to one side, there was one more box. And here's what I found when I opened it up. I had completely and utterly forgotten until this moment that I'd somehow had the foresight to store my 50 disc backup of my Amiga 500's GVP A530 hard disc in 1993 before selling the whole lot. Now Dennis Gunnell's A backup was a very cool backup program in that if you changed a file on your hard disc, it intelligently knew what floppy disk that file was backed up onto, and only asked you to therefore insert that one floppy disk to update the entire backup set. And with my own Amiga now back home in the US and A, I might just be able to restore my entire teenage Amiga 500 setup, containing all my music compositions, my letters, my favorite programs and games, exactly as it was when I was a kid. But there was one problem. See, these discs had been in a sweaty, freezing British Victorian attic for 25 years. And worse still, you see these holes I'd punched and cut out of the corners? Well, that hole tells the computer it's reading a high-density disc. And real high-density discs have those holes from the factory. But these weren't real high-density discs. They were just double-density discs that I'd tricked the system into believing were higher quality magnetic media than they were. Naughty boy. And that way, an 880 kilobyte disc with 11 sectors per track doubled to 1760 kilobytes and 22 sectors, shrinking my backup from 100 to 50 discs. One of the few times shrinkage was good. Anyway, back home with my Amiga and my computer, <laughs> uh, I nervously put a backup into the drive, praying that it would work. And it did, a backup loaded. But now for the really big moment, restoring all of that data from the 50 discs. I inserted disc number one. Oh, for f And same error with every single disc. Just a bunch of question marks. Well, anyway, I took three of the discs to the next meetup of SCAN, the local Commodore user group, where Robert Bernardo had brought his Amiga 1000 along. And, well, here's what we saw when we inserted it into the Amiga 1000. It said DF0, abuk, abuk. Well, anyway, that means A backup. Well, this was great. A backup 
it could see the backups. And we realized that the culprit was those corners I had cut, kind of. You see, his Amiga 1000 had a high density disk drive and it had totally escaped my memory that the Amiga 500 didn't. In fact, only the Amiga 3000 shipped with a high density disk drive. So I'd been trying to read my high density disks, albeit fake ones, in a double density drive. So the disks were just invisible to my Amiga. Now this meant all I needed was a high density Chinon FZ357A external floppy drive. I tell you, I've never opened Fleabay faster. And best of all, I, in theory, I wouldn't even need a different floppy controller. It just works in the Amiga 500 by spinning at half the normal speed, 150 revs per minute when a high density floppy disk is inserted, enabling the existing floppy controller to still be used. So yeah, my external drive that I made the backup on as a kid must have been high density, most likely one from Amitech or Power Computing. Anyhow, soon my external floppy arrived. Could I finally restore these 50 disks stored in a sweaty attic for 25 years? Yes, <laughs> it worked. Here are the actual photos I took at the time. I was so excited. I didn't even know I'd be making YouTube videos three years later. But uh, again, I had the foresight to do it somehow. And um, you can also see Puppy Fractic the first and second keeping me company here as a backup does its thing, slowly decompressing and decrunching and restoring the disks onto my Kipper 2K compact flash hard disk inside that A500. And would you believe of the 50 disks, 44 of them worked. And after several hours of crunching and decrunching, after a reboot, there was my original workbench with even my favorite font and my favorite wallpaper all intact, just as I'd left them. Opening that hard disk drawer for the first time in quarter of a century was as magical as opening those boxes up in the attic. Yet somehow in a weird kind of way, even more magical because being digital, Nothing here had aged. It was exactly as I'd left it. And that's how I was able to bring songs like The Lost Years and One of Those Things, written back in the 90s and recorded on that Amiga, Back from the Dead, using my original Dr. T's KCS music notation of those songs. And as I recounted in this forum post, I even found a letter I'd written to a girl when I was about 16, saying, I'm not completely sure why I'm writing this, but I hope that one day I'll get the chance to at least look back on it myself. One day indeed. Now I won't show you all my old programs and files, especially Grinder here, uh, not what you think, but do let me know if you'd like to see an exploration of my 1993 setup. But what I will say is that those six discs with errors still bothered me. I'm a perfectionist, okay? There's nothing wrong with being perfect. I wanted it all back. And so I kept trying various disc repair programs and other tips and tricks and just nothing worked. Until magically, one day I put the discs in, every single one of them had just started working. Now on the forums, we deduced that the simple act of exercising the discs and rubbing the magnetic media against the cleaning dust jacket that's inside every disc had basically removed any mold and dust, finally allowing the drive head to see all the data. Artificial resuscitation, if you will. And on those discs, I found the original advert I typed in 1993 to sell my old Amiga. The force really does work in mysterious ways. And in a way, I've been living in 1993 ever since. See you there. Let's look at some homebrew games. Homebrew. Old news. And let's see who's receiving their RR badge this week. Uh, this goes to anybody who submits something that we use in the video. So homebrew games, beautiful. And this affords you entry to a small but growing list of retro computing museums around the world. If you go to perifractic.com slash badge. Yeah, if you want to submit something as well, go to perifractic.com slash Submit. And the first person getting their RR badge is Gaz Marshall. He got hooked to this uh, homebrew coding. 
Jetpack Jock was made. Jetpack Jock. Um, do you want to say it in a Scottish accent? Oh, I don't think I can do Scottish. Well, I knew at the time. <laughs> oh, I knew at the time. I, I know I can't That's do Scottish. Irish. All I knew at the time is that I wanted a jetpack style game. As before, I involved the community and feedback from the initial release was fantastic. They all commented that the game was too hard, so I introduced an energy bar, which pleased most of them. I mean, I do love an energy bar. The final release was in July and published in September 2020 by TFW 8-Bit. The future was 8-Bit. Oh. Very cool. Jetpack Jock. Very cool. Um, and a jock is a, a what's the what's the word? An affectionate term for a Scottish man. Oh. Uh, whereas over here, it's a. It's an athletic person. Yeah. It, it, I feel like here, it's, is it kind of derogatory? Like he's a bit of a jock. Um, it. It's more like when I think of jock, it's like a high school football player. It, so it's, it's not. I mean, it depends. You could be or, like, yeah, he's a jock, or you could be like, he's a jock. I mean, it's there are many words that it's all about context. And does it come from jockstrap? Because they're athletic. Uh, probably. We okay. didn't have a football team where I went to high school, so I didn't know anyone wearing. You mean uh, American football? Yes. Thank you. I'm still. Learning. No, we didn't have. We didn't have sports. <laughs> I'm still learning all these Americanisms. Gaz did add that all this wouldn't be possible if he wasn't inspired by the seven-bit chick and Geriatric's Ancient Cookbook. I think he means the 8-bit guy and Perifractic Retro Recipes. 7-bit chick. But, uh, oh, you could be the 7-bit chick and I'm Geriatric. <laughs> if I do hit a million, I'll be Geriatric Retro Recipes by that time. We'll see. on 1K. I think it's 100K. 100K. That's it, well done. I wonder why I'm only seven. Seven because I'm like smaller as a lady and not nine because I'm smarter as a lady. I'm sure you just picked a number. <laughs> it was going to be one of two and it was 50-50. Speaking of picking numbers, um, this is a QR code. It absolutely is. Comprised of binary, basically ones and zeros, numbers. Uh, now this is by MS Harvey. Now I'm not going to show you guys what this is, but you can scan it on the screen with your very clever modern uh, computer devices, otherwise known as cell phones. So this creates uh, a text, um, a basic listing. There's actually a poem and it's rather cute. So have fun scanning that QR code. After this video. <laughs> yes, after this video, don't forget. Now, next, Michael Battaglia has created Retromance, which was our song that we you sang on, uh, on a Commodore 64. So um, he said, Retromance inspired me to see how the song would sound on an actual C64. Of course, it has too many voices to be played in a SID file without removing different tracks or voices. So he decided to go the route of Digi. So this is basically a technique where you digitize. Not many people realize you can do that, but the SID chip and the audio input at the back has a pin just for in, in, input. It has a pin on the chip just for input. So you can actually, it's how they got stuff like Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters! <laughs> so obviously it's very low bit rate, um, but you can still hear it. It's very cool. Now we should move on to this by Jesse Taylor. Now, Iridium is one of my favorite games on the Commodore 64. It had this amazing spinning ship. If you watch when the ship uh, does this little twisty turn, that motion was so cool back in the C64. He's re remade this, not raided this, <laughs> remade this uh, using Unreal Engine, which is a modern game coding uh, engine. Language, what would you, what would you call it? <laughs> ah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm so mesmerized. This is really well done. It's so clean. Yeah, the visuals are beautiful. Uh, and he says the visual effects and the UI were done in Unreal Engine. Plus I modeled the Dreadnought ships and most of the enemies in Blender. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Blender's the 3D modeling thing that I used for the Lego Commodore 64. Yeah. No, okay. Brick 64. Uh, Lee Metcalf created the background nebulas in Photoshop. Wow. It's a real mishmash uh, in a good way of different programs. And he modeled the Manta Fighter and some of the enemies in Maya, which is another 3D modeling program. And Jesse says they'd be happy to release it, but they are waiting to get approval from Andrew Braybrook, who coded the original. That is a very cool spin. Yeah. Uh, and Empire Strikes Back, which is being remade for 
uh, Commodore 64, the Atari 2600 version, <laughs> Tokyo, uh, that uses the same kind of spin on the snow speeder. And I actually wrote about that recently. Do you remember what magazine I am writing in? Is it Snap? And crackle? Splash and crack? <laughs> it is Zap64, which really should have gone in our old news old section. Old news. Old news. Because Zap64 magazine is back. It's literally being printed as we speak. The first... I can hear it. No, I can't. I did, I did hear some. Yeah, I'm one of the reviewers. I'm so proud to be a writer for that magazine. and did a preview of Empire Strikes Back. But do check out the link in the description if you would like. The first time in probably 30 years, a copy of Zap64 should like one come through your letterbox again. It was really a, a pop culture icon back in England uh, and uh, I couldn't be proud of it. Zap64, also Crash as well, the ZX Spectrum sister magazine is back as well. Also the annual, the Zap64 2021 annual uh, is, is being printed as well as we speak. So if you back that on Kickstarter, you can get That's that. Nice for it, yeah. There it is. Also, with Early Access supporters now, is my reheated documentary about Zap, along with a look at the new issue and 2021 annual. I've actually I've got real butterflies. Fight the monsters, solve the puzzles, beat the big baddie. Also, that's the end of what I've got to say. You're a good girl. Now we should move on to some delicious, tasty bowl of nostalgia flakes. Mm. And first up, we've got one of our Patreons, Sol. Sol sent in this and he says, this, is, this first photo is of myself on the left in 1979 with his late father and two younger brothers opening an Atari 2600 at Christmas. Sorry, this still blows my mind. There is people uh, in, like Sol enjoying this in 1979. And there's mine that I enjoyed making a video about just a few weeks ago. David has the audacity to create a company releasing cartridges for that and I dare say we'll be unboxing those uh, cartridges this coming Christmas 2021 and feeling just as happy um, so I just love seeing photos like this it just just blows my mind his expression is like I cannot wait to crack into that box and play some games well he just... says exactly that oh. he says you can see I'm too focused on the Atari to properly smile for the photo <laughs> Um, I think everybody is, is occupied with something, but I, he's just like... Exactly. Mm, I look at cake like that. You do. Um, and he says, I retrieved this Atari unit from my mother shortly before she passed. And he set it up for use for nostalgic fun and to test out a newly created homebrew game. Homebrews. <laughs> Old news. Um, this is his work in progress. Uh, it's called Immunity. He hopes to release this game through Atari Age when it's ready. And he says, thank you, Retro Recipes, for helping to inspire a lot of retro fun. You are very welcome. So is that, um, is this COVID spores, do we think? I don't know. It's called it's, immunity. Kind of looks like a frogger type thing. Yeah. And you just have to avoid getting COVID-19. Ah, COVID-1979. Very cute. It's not, COVID's not cute. Next up, we have Nikoka Noel. And this is Nikoka Noel's daughter playing her arcade one-up. Wow. Very impressive. It's the same table you have. Somebody's been to Ikea. So this is what they'd call the bar top arcade version. Mm. It's like the little mini version. Again, so wonderful to see uh, a new generation enjoying old games that, that I grew up on. And, you grew up on the NES, didn't you? I did, but I also used to play a lot of arcade games. We used to go to the local um, bowling alley or, you know, skate roller rink. But I was just thinking, I really think that video games are an important part of children's lives. It really helps develop hand-eye coordination. We all turned out okay. We did, yeah. I'm okay. So from that to this, you remember we did the Raspberry Pi 400 video and the unboxing of that? Mm -hmm. And of course, Lady Fractic, you unscrewed it with your famous sound effect. Eww, eww, eww. And it, which is now. Eww. 
so Mr. Peel sent this in. This is his son, Harry. Both of them were inspired to get the Pi 400 and get RetroPi running on it. But also Harry received, they <laughs> ordered some signed photos from perifractic.com. So uh, we can see there, here is Harry with Harry Potter. And this was me in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Not only that, but he also got me in Batman, the Dark Knight trilogy. That's me with- um, Christian Bale. Christian Bale. So Harry modeling Batman there. And Harry with Kai Thrinali, which was uh, my <laughs> character I voiced in Lego Force Awakens. And that's it. <laughs> So thanks for sharing those, Mr. Peel. It's very cool to see how happy Harry was with his signed photos and his He's Raspberry so Pi. Moving on very briefly, this is Marcus Toftal. He's created these mini game boxes. Now this looks pretty normal, right? Yeah. I mean, the joystick's very, very large, but... Uh, here we have full scale. You can now perhaps realize that's a C64 mini. If only you had your banana for scale. Excuse me? <laughs> oh! <laughs> anyway. So these are um, created, uh, inspired by the C64 Mini uh, 1541 drive over there. And Marcus created these miniature game boxes to add to his mini collection. Uh, he actually used cardboard, card, not bald, cardboard jewelry boxes from Amazon as a base. Oh, very clever. Yeah. Uh, and the criteria was that three and a half inch disc should fit in the box, which it does. Oh, good. Thanks for sharing that, Marcus. And that is it for the retro show. Retro show. And don't forget to check out the link in the description to grab your freebies in Dragon City. Um, we'll be back probably in about a month with another retro show. Sounds and in, good to me. In between, we'll always do those retro recipes that you know and love. Until then, just remains for us to say thanks for watching, subscribe and support below, and... Cheerio! Cheerio! <laughs>